terms have been almost completely marked. Hopefully, uh, we will be able to release the marks uh, tomorrow. Uh, and we will go in class over the problems. And I really apologize very much for this terrible uh, mess up that uh, my admin did, that uh, half of you started late. I will uh, do my best to compensate uh, for that as justly as uh, possible. And uh, um, so the next topic that uh, we are going to cover will be maximum flow. Uh, then we will do string matching algorithms. And we will see exactly what we will finish with, because I want to devote uh, uh, the last week to uh, doing uh, uh, problems of the type that will be on the final, right? So on the final, you will be tested only about the second part of the material, so dynamic programming, uh, max flow, uh, string matching, and uh, whatever we finish with. Um, and uh, I'll... Uh, give you again practice problems, and uh, I'll make sure that we do really lots of problems, especially dynamic programming and uh, max flow, because they are so uh, important. Okay, so what is a flow network? Flow network is essentially a weighted directed graph uh, that uh, whose intended purpose is to model uh, several types of practical problems. <clears throat> For example, logistic problems, you can think, so what is a um, flow network? It's a directed graph in which each edge has a weight that is, uh, in this case, called uh, the capacity. Um, and you have two distinguished source, two distinguished nodes uh, of the graph, S and T. S is called source, and T is called sink. And the way to think about that is that, for example, S is, uh, uh, say, a iron ore mine somewhere in Australia, and then guess what should T be? T is China, right? <laughs> okay, so in the flow network, uh, from the mine, you have several options how to get ore to China. Um, <clears throat> uh, for example, you can have <coughs> uh, trains uh, uh, shipping uh, the ore to some ports. Uh, then you have ships uh, that... Uh, uh, carry the ore to ports in China, and then in China you have, uh, um, uh, for example, trains and uh, maybe trucks uh, that carry the ore to the um, steel mills, right? Uh, of course, uh, luckily for us, money goes in the opposite direction, right? So um, the edges are capacities uh, of these uh, transportation uh, channels, for example, 16 whatever thousand uh, uh, tons a day uh, can be shipped from the mine to the first port, and uh, uh, for example, capacity of trucks to ship ore to the second port is 13,000 uh, tons a day. Uh, this is the capacity of the ships to uh, move the ore from one port to the other port, and here again it's a capacity of railways or uh, roads with trucks to move the ore to the steel mills. So uh, in the most basic example, you have only one source and only one sink. Of course, this is not realistic for most of the transportation problems, but we will see later how to model networks in which you have uh, several sources and uh, several things. So what is your objective, right? 
well, your objective is uh, to ship as much ore as possible without, uh, of course, exceeding the capacity of each of the routes, right? Since the capacity is 16,000 tons a day, uh, say, over this link, you cannot ship more than that, right? Um, and, uh, um, but maybe one port has larger capacity than another port, so it makes sense to ship the ore to the first port and then by ship to move it to the other port by a local shipping, right, and then uh, use uh, these uh, transoceanic shipping routes uh, uh, to ship further. So your goal is to maximize throughput uh, through the network, transportation network. Another um, uh, example would be if these are, uh, say, oil wells, uh, and T is a refinery, and these are uh, the um, uh, oil pipelines, right, that, uh, uh, that can ship uh, oil from the wells to, again, uh, transportation facilities. Uh, or it can be a computer network, right, uh, in which S is a, a pirating website and T is U, and you want to download as quickly as possible the latest episodes of whatever is uh, nowadays terribly popular. I would have no clue about that. And uh, so you want to route uh, uh, as many packets as possible uh, through the network um, to download uh, this movie as quickly as possible. So you can just imagine there is uh, a huge number of uh, highly important practical problems that can be modeled uh, as uh, a maximal flow problem in um, a flow network. But uh, interestingly enough, uh, even problems that prima facie um, uh, have nothing to do with uh, uh, flow networks are reducible to max flow in flow networks, as you will see, uh, things like maximal bipartite matchings uh, uh, and many other, um, in graphs and many other problems as well, okay? So these are truly, this is a truly important uh, problem for uh, practical purposes entirely. So what is a flow in a network. So network per se is just uh, a directed graph uh, with the source and sink and the weights on the edges represent the capacity of each edge. Now you might have a flow uh, through this network which is a real valued non-negative function that maps each edge into positive reals. It simply tells you how much stuff is flowing through a particular edge, right? And of course, now <coughs> uh, in this setup, your, uh, the all the flows have to, uh, legitimate flows have to satisfy uh, several constraints. First one is that flow through each edge cannot exceed the capacity of that edge, right? And it has to go in the direction of that edge. So we are assuming that these are directional, uh, uh, unidirectional um, uh, transportation channels. And if there is, uh, if you need to uh, be able to ship things between two vertices, then you need uh, uh, two edges in opposite direction, right? So, so this is called the capacity constraint. No flow can exceed the capacity of the corresponding pipe. And the second constraint, which is called flow conservation, simply says that in interme intermediate vertices can neither lose flow, they cannot leak out the flow, nor they can add flow, namely, uh, the sum total of flow into 
each vertex, except for the sink, uh, source and sink, has to be equal to the outgoing flow. So uh, you cannot um, lose flow in any of the intermediate vertices or generate additional flow. Okay. So the value of the flow is, uh, as you would expect, defined as some total of the flow leaving the source. And because of the network, sorry, because of the flow preservation property, this of course has to be equal to the flow that is incoming to the sink, right? Because we assume that no intermediate nodes can leak the flow or uh, add uh, additional flow. So here is an example of a network with some flow in it, and the convention is that the first number uh, indicates the amount of flow that goes through the edge, and the second number indicates the total capacity of the edge. So for example, from S to V1, we have 11 units uh, going this direction uh, out of total capacity of 16 units, which means that you have spare capacity of five units uh, to pump uh, five additional units uh, uh, into vertex V1, but of course you cannot exceed uh, the capacity of outgoing uh, uh, vertices, right, because uh, everything that comes to a vertex has to uh, leave uh, through an outgoing edge. Right? So uh, the problem is uh, um, to simply distribute the flow through the network in such a way that a flow conservation property is satisfied, so no vertex is saturated with more flow than uh, what leaves, uh, more incoming flow than what leaves uh, uh, that vertex, and the total amount of flow is maximal possible, right? And clearly this is a finite number because maximal flow is uh, always smaller or equal to the sum of the capacities of, or, of all either outgoing edges from the source or incoming edges uh, uh, of the sink. So the problem is, uh, if I give you such a graph, such a map of uh, uh, transportation uh, network, uh, or whatever it is that you are modeling, your task is to, the, to route uh, all the, to route flow in an optimal way so that the maxim, that the throughput through the network, total throughput from S to T is uh, as large as possible. Okay, in order to solve this problem, a very useful notion is uh, the notion of residual flow network uh, for a flow network with some flow in it. Uh, so essentially, the residual flow network is the network of leftover capacities, uh, but uh, with one uh, important provisio, which you are going to see right now. So this is the residual flow network for this particular network, okay? And uh, uh, you can see, for example, here through this edge, we have a flow of 11 uh, units out of 16 possible max units, right? This means that the residual capacity in this direction is five units. But you have also a virtual pipe going in opposite direction, which is equal to the amount of flow that goes in the original direction. Why is this so? Uh, well, one way you can simply think of this capacity is opposite direction to correspond to the fact that you can reduce this 11 uh, flow, uh, a flow of 11 units in the, uh, from S to V1 to some lower value. So you can reduce the flow, 
and that precisely corresponds to ability to move. Uh, um, of course, this would kind of be um, uh, redundant because uh, right uh, flow in this direction is essentially reducing flow in opposite direction, right? But it is a very good technical uh, trick to um, uh, for algorithms for max flow because it allows you, as you will see in a moment, to reroute uh, flow in a kind of systematic uh, systematic way. So, for example, here, because we have a flow of 12 through a pipe of capacity 12, this edge has disappeared because the capacity, in, a leftover capacity in this direction is zero units, right? The pipe is completely saturated. But in opposite direction, you can reduce this flow of 12 units into any smaller value, right? So, uh, and reducing what you pump in this direction is essentially uh, like having a channel that returns a certain amount in uh, this direction. So if you reduce this 11 to 10, that's the same as keeping 11 in this direction, but flowing, having a flow of one in opposite direction, right? So, uh, this is a technical kind of uh, gadget, but it's extremely useful for uh, reducing the max flow algorithm to essentially a graph algorithm. Okay, so um, this is, so now, why do we need residual flow network? Uh, well, the um, algorithms for finding max flow, at least one of the most uh, popular one for the Folkerson algorithm that we will see in a moment, uh, is kind of extremely, kind of natural uh, algorithm. Simply, if you have certain flow to a network, uh, you simply look for uh, augmenting paths Namely, you simply try to find a, 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 through the residual network, a path that goes from S to T, and for, you can then increase the total flow by adding to the existing flow whatever flow can go through this augmenting path. So what do you think in the residual network what is the maximal, what determines the maximal capacity, the maximal flow that we can add? Hmm? Exactly. Uh, it is the minimal capacity of an edge in the residual flow, right? Because that will be the bottleneck. So you simply, in uh, one possible algorithm, would be simply to look for uh, augmenting paths, increase the flow along the corresponding edges for the minimal capacity of these augmenting paths. So for example, here you have five, you have five here and five here, sorry, you have five, four and five. So bottleneck is flow four. So you can then increase the flow uh, through the network by four units uh, along these edges. And lo and behold, what is going to happen? Well, nothing happens in all the edges that were exist that um, were not on the residual, on, sorry, on the augmenting path. Obviously, the flow will not change. But for example, here, instead of eight units going this way, we will have 12 units because the capacity of the augmenting path is four, right? So let's see what happens um, along the, this edge. Along this edge, you have a flow in this direction of four, and you had a flow of four in opposite direction previously. So when we add the flow in this direction through this edge, how much flow uh, will be, what will be the resulting flow to, through this edge? Zero, exactly, because uh, 
you are reducing the flow uh, for precisely uh, the flow in opposite direction. So for that reason, uh, there will be um, uh, no uh, flow going this direction, right? And uh, the total capacity will go back uh, to nine, right? Because uh, this four going this direction is canceled by four uh, flow of four units going in the opposite direction. So you will get the flow of zero through this pipe. And the only other affected edge is this one. Uh, and it was five, sorry, it was 15 going this way and we added four. So it will be 19 uh, going uh, uh, in the appropriate direction from V3 to T, right? So you simply uh, look for augmenting paths. You can use any uh, graph search algorithms to find uh, paths from S to T, uh, find the minimum, uh, the bottleneck on this part, sorry, on this path, and then increase the flows uh, um, appropriately. Okay, so we do that uh, for as long as we can, right? Uh, because if the, uh, the capacities are all integers, uh, clearly after each iteration the flow increases and eventually it has to uh, stabilize because uh, the total flow, as we mentioned, cannot exceed the capacity of all edges leaving the source or the capacity of all edges uh, and also, of course, the capacity of all edges flowing into the sink. And once, you, once your algorithm terminates, when you can no longer find uh, augmenting paths, you get the maximal flow. What? So, something sounds fishy with this algorithm. Uh, what do you think, uh, what would be natural question to ask. You see, you added augmenting paths in an arbitrary way, yeah? right? And maybe you were not smart enough to choose the right way. Maybe you caused a saturation in one of the vertices where in effect you could have uh, chosen a different augmenting paths that would lead to a higher value, right? Why would the arbitrary um, uh, way of adding augmenting paths result in the same total uh, uh, flow through the graph? Now, notice I didn't say that it will result in the same distribution of flow to the network. So you might get, in fact, by using different augmenting paths, you might get different distribution of flow but the sum total of the flow through the network will be the same. And to see that, uh, it's uh, actually non-trivial. <clears throat> and the only way to see that is to give a rigorous, I would hate to call it mathematical proof, but it is kind of mathematical type of argument, uh, to show that no matter how you add flow by choosing possibly different uh, augmenting paths, the, ma the maximum amount that you will, when the algorithm terminates, uh, will be independent on how you added uh, the augmenting paths. Uh, so, to so you can see on the slides uh, how the uh, procedure of augmenting paths uh, uh, proceeds with these particular choices. And at the end, uh, you end up with residual flow network so that there is no augmenting path from S to T. For example, from S you can go to V1. From V1 you can go to V2. 
from V2, you can go to V4, but you cannot leave V4 anywhere else, right? And also, that's, uh, you can here only go back to S, right? And uh, so there are no more augmenting paths. So um, let us now first see why the, this procedure uh, terminates at all. Maybe we can get into a loop, uh, rerouting flows uh, uh, through the network uh, always, but this is obviously not the case because each addition of a flow through augmenting path increases the total throughput to the network precisely <coughs> for the flow through this um, augmenting, augmenting path. So eventually it has to terminate. But uh, why does it terminate um, uh, with the largest possible amount, right? Maybe you have achieved some local max, but it is, there is some better distribution. To see that, um, we need an interesting, we need a concept uh, of the, in the net, network flows that is called a cut. A cut is simply any partition of the vertices of the underlying graph into two disjoint subsets so that uh, uh, it's uh, a partition, so the union of the two parts is, are all the vertices of the graph. The parts are disjoint and the source belongs to one side and the sink belongs to the other side of the, of the partition. So geometrically, um, let me see if, uh, here it is on this picture. So it doesn't matter how you partition. So here, for example, I partition this just by a vertical line. So black uh, vertices are one part of the flow network which contains the source and the white vertices are the other uh, part. Now there are several um, important uh, quantities associated with each cut. Uh, the capacity of the cut is simply some total of capacities of all edges that go from the side where the sink is to the side where the source, uh, the, sorry, from the, uh, the capacity of all edges that go from the side where the source is to the side where the sink is. And you don't, you ignore edges that go in opposite direction. So for example, here you have one edge with capacity 12 uh, this edge is in opposite direction, so it doesn't count. And in this direction, you have capacity 14, so the uh, sum total uh, capacity of this particular cut is just uh, 26, right? So you ignore pipes that go in opposite direction, right? And you simply sum total all the pipes that go in the forward direction from the source part to the sink part. So that's one important uh, parameter. It's called the, the capacity of the cut. And then you can also have the flow through the cut. What is the flow through the cut? The net flow through the cut is simply some total of flow from S part to T part minus the flow in opposite direction. So when we did, when we defined capacity of the cut, we ignored the flow in op the capacity of the uh, pipes in the opposite direction. But when we compute the net flow through the network, to, sorry, through the cut, uh, it is. Uh, sum of all flows that go from S part to T part minus the flow that goes in the opposite direction. So for example, here in forward direction, you have 
12 uh, plus 11 is 23 minus 4, right? So the net flow is uh, 19, okay? So it's all very natural. Sorry, I'm still terribly jet-lagged from the trip to China with our ICM uh, programming competition team, so um, I'm not sure whether I'm teaching you or I'm just dreaming on the plane that I'm doing the lecture. So, okay, this is, uh, um, these are the two important features. Now, the crucial theorem about uh, flow networks is the following theorem that says <coughs> that the maximal amount of flow that can go through a network is precisely equal to the capacity of the cut of minimal capacity, right? So um, the, the notice that um, the definition of the mean cut, minimal capacity cut, is independent of any flow present in the network, right? Uh, it is uh, simply when you look at your network flow graph, you consider all possible partitions of your graph, right? Um, and you look which one has minimal capacity, then maximal flow through the network is precisely equal to the capacity of uh, this uh, uh, minimal capacity cut. Okay, so first of all, um, I claim every flow, maximal or not maximal, must be smaller than the capacity of any cut. Why is this so? <clears throat> Why any flow whatsoever can never exceed capacity of any cut whatsoever? Why would this be so? Exactly, so flow, because the, the cut separates vertices into two disjoint uh, subsets, one containing source, the other containing sink. Any flow must cross that particular cut. But of course, that flow cannot exceed the capacity of that, uh, uh, of that cut simply because it cannot exceed the capacity of, of all vertices from S to T, right? Because every flow has to cross along uh, um, any part of that flow has to cross through some of these edges, and then, of course, the flow cannot exceed the capacity of the, um, uh, of the, of that cut. But uh, um, this has one important consequence. It has the consequence that if you do find a flow that is equal to the capacity of a cut, that flow must be maximal possible and the capacity of uh, uh, that uh, cut must be minimal possible. Why is this so? Well, we just mentioned that uh, Every cut <coughs> must have larger of equal capacity than any flow through the network. So all the network, all possible network flows, any value of the flow through the network must be smaller than the capacity of any cut. So if you hit a, a, a capacity of one cut that is equal to a flow, because every flow is smaller or equal than the capacity of that uh, uh, cut, 
uh, and your flow attains that uh, capacity, then this is the maximal possible flow, right? Because any ca capacity of any cut is larger or equal than any flow. And vice versa, <coughs> uh, right, for the very same reason, because the capacity uh, of any cut uh, is larger or equal than that flow, clearly, and that flow equals the capacity of this particular cut, clearly all other cuts have to have capacity greater or equal than that, uh, the capacity of uh, this cut uh, uh, whose capacity we reached uh, with that particular flow, right? So every cut bounds every flow. If you find a flow that um, reaches the capacity of, the, of a cut, then the flow must be maximal possible and uh, the capacity of the cut is minimal. So this in particular means that uh, in order to prove the correctness of ford falkerson algorithm, we simply have to show that when ford falkerson algorithm terminates, the flow obtained, the max, the, this particular uh, exiting flow, is equal to a capacity of a cut because then we will know that that flow is the largest possible and that cut is of the smallest possible capacity. So let's assume now that the Ford Falkerson algorithm has terminated and that there are no more augmenting paths from the source S to, sink, to the sink T in the residual network flow. So what we will do now, uh, <coughs> uh, we will look for all vertices to which there is still some uh, augmenting path to that vertex only. We know that uh, uh, sync is not such a vertex because Ford Falkerson terminated, so there are no augmenting paths from S all the way to T, but we will look at all vertices for which there is, there is still a leftover capacity. For example, here, even though you cannot go from S directly to T, you can go from S to the vertex V1 because you have leftover capacity of five in this direction. Similarly, in this direction, you have leftover capacity one, so this vertex is reachable by an augmenting path. Uh, as is vertex four, because augmenting path could be of capacity one here, uh, and then this link of capacity three, so there exists an augmenting path of capacity one from S to four, but it's easy to see that there are no augmenting paths to V3. Now what we are <coughs> going to show is, uh, so do you understand how the cut is generated? You simply look, uh, what are the vertices that can be still reached uh, from the source? We know that we cannot reach T because the Ford Falkerson terminated, there are no more augmenting paths all the way from S to T. So we look for all vertices that are still reachable and we put them in one side of the cut, right? And all other non-reachable vertices are put in the <coughs> other side of the cut. And of course, the sink is there because uh, uh, when Ford Falkerson terminates, uh, uh, T will not be reachable for S. That's exactly the exit condition for the loop in Ford Falkerson, right? So now what we want to show is uh, <coughs> that the flow through this cut is precisely equal to the capacity, uh, sorry, it's precisely equal 
to its uh, capacity. So the flow is uh, through this uh, cut is fully saturated, right? The capacity is fully saturated. Well, <coughs> um, assume the opposite. Assume that there exists, in fact, an edge that goes from S side to T side with some leftover capacity, say, for example, it's three out of five. Why do you think this is impossible? Why is this a contradiction? Exactly, you see, S contains all the vertices from which there exists an augmenting path to that vertex. So there would be an augmenting path to this vertex, whatever is denoted here, I cannot see it. Uh, uh, is it you? Right? If there was a leftover capacity, then there would be an augmenting path from S to this point simply by adding uh, um, uh, this uh, last edge to the augmenting path to U, right? But we assume that uh, in T are only the vertices that are not reachable, so there can be no leftover capacity in this direction, right? So, uh, on the other hand, the flow is opposite direction must be equal to zero. Why is this so? Well, if the flow in opposite direction wasn't zero, residual flow network would have capacity in opposite direction equal to the flow uh, in the original direction. So again, you would have a path uh, by definition to the point X, and you could uh, use this augmenting this edge uh, right from X to Y, this virtual edge, because the, uh, we assume there is flow in opposite direction, to reach also Y. But this is impossible, right? Because Y is in, unreachable by definition of the cut. So this means uh, all, <coughs> all pipes uh, in the direction from S to T are fully saturated, and there is no flow in opposite direction whatsoever, right? This means that uh, the flow is precisely equal to the capacity of the cut, because the capacity of the cut is exactly the sum of the capacities of all edges from S to T, right? Um, so they are all fully saturated, in the opposite direction, nothing flows, and opposite direction edges are not taken into account when we compute the capacity of the cut. Thus, the flow through the network precisely equal the capacity of the cut that Ford Folkerson algorithm produces naturally, right? So no matter how you add augmenting paths, you will end up with the same max flow simply because max flow is equal to the capacity of mean cut. And mean cut is defined without any reference to a flow. It's simply you consider all possible divisions of the flow network into two, so that source is in one side, sink is in the, on the other side, and you sum up the total capacities of links from S to T. And you look for the cut with minimal capacity. There is no mention of a flow in the definition of mean cut at all. So if the flow is equal, if the flow of Ford Fulkerson is equal to the capacity of mean cut, clearly uh, it, uh, it does not depend, uh, the, uh, the value of the flow does not depend on the way how you added, um, how you added augmenting paths. So you see, this is a beautiful example how mathematics intervenes 
to prove correctness of the algorithm, right? It's totally non-trivial why arbitrary addition of augmenting cuts, uh, oh, sorry, augmenting pads has to result uh, in uh, the same total amount of flow after the algorithm terminates. Uh, but because we reduced uh, this terminal total flow uh, to the capacity of mean cut that is independent of any flow, then clearly, um, and whenever a flow is equal to a mean cut, it must be maximal possible flow. So uh, this proves uh, the correctness of Ford Falkerson um, algorithm. Okay, now it, while it is true that, uh, um, okay, so before we move uh, uh, further on the exams, uh, students are lazy to draw residual network flows. And they try to simply use the, uh, the original uh, flow network and simply change the capacities uh, and try to get maximal possible flow. And this is a recipe for disaster because it's very easy to miss legitimate augmenting paths uh, if you don't draw the residual network uh, flow graph. Let me give you an example. So here is a very simple uh, flow network with only four vertices. Uh, uh, and all the capacities are one. And these are the flows. You have one, 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 right? And it looks like uh, you cannot add more augmenting pads. Why? Well, from S you cannot go to U because this pipe is fully occupied with a flow of one of, of uh, with total capacity one, right? You can add a flow of one to this node, um, right? But now this link is fully occupied and you cannot reach D, right? So it looks as if uh, uh, there are no more augmenting paths. But this is false because in the residual network flow, this edge disappears and you have edge in opposite direction because you can block, you can reduce the flow of one in this direction. So zero capacity in this direction, so this edge disappears, but you get the edge in opposite direction. Here in this direction, you have leftover capacity one, but now notice you have a virtual edge from V to U because you have a flow of one in this direction that you can reduce. And this is equivalent to having a pipe in opposite direction of capacity one. And lo and behold, now this is a legitimate augmenting path, right? And when you add um, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, path, you will get right, a flow of one here and flow of one here and also flow of one here and flow of one here. And so the total flow is two. And of course it must be maximal because the capacity of outgoing ages, total capacity is just two. So it's crucially important uh, not to be lazy and to draw the residual flow network uh, and look for augmenting paths there because it's extremely easy to miss a legitimate flow uh, augmenting, uh, um, augmenting paths, right? Uh, because this example clearly shows uh, why this is so. Okay, so let's make a five minute break before we continue. <laughs> 